Hello everyone, welcome to our online talk today which will be starting shortly at 3 o'clock in a few minutes time. For those of you who are here early today, we would like to share with you a short video from the firm. I founded the firm in September 1985 with the vision of seeking truth and justice for our clients and not just winning their cases. Over the years, the team has achieved many significant milestones. We are today recognized by the Legal 500, Asia Law Profiles, and Asian Legal Business as a recommended firm in various practice areas. While we have embraced technology to make our services efficient and responsive, we continue to grow on the bedrock of meticulous preparation and hard work, for which there is really no substitute. As legal practice becomes increasingly international, we keep ourselves ahead of the curve with our relationship with lawyers from around the world. Our firm is a founding member of the League of Lawyers, a growing international network of law firms in 20 Asian and European countries. We believe in partnering with our clients to protect and grow their business. We achieve this by holding firm to our values of integrity and justice, while giving our best to deliver effective and efficient solutions. Instead of just legal services, we focus on developing great working relationships based on understanding and respect. The firm invests in its team and emphasizes professional development. We are keen to share our knowledge and publish our articles on our website. And we also give back with our corporate social responsibility activities. We cultivate a passion for the law and enjoy what we do. This brings out the best in us for our clients today and tomorrow. We regularly advise foreign clients, including many Chinese investors, and have a ready appreciation for different ways of doing business. In corporate matters, we offer relevant and commercial solutions, often raising issues that clients may or may not have realized before. In negotiations, we believe in facilitating win-win outcomes. Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for giving us your time on this midweek afternoon. My name is Jasmine Wong and I'm the firm's senior associate. I will also be your moderator for today's session. Today, we will be hearing directly from Tommy Wong and Mira Marshall, who will be speaking on company constitutions. Are they necessary? Now, before we start today's session, allow me to introduce the firm and what we do. Mahueng Kwe and Associates is a mid-sized law firm that was founded in 1985 by Datuk Mahueng Kwe. Our team today comprises of 28 lawyers and a support team of 19 people. Datuk Ma is now a consultant with our firm following his retirement from the Court of Appeal bench in 2015. The firm also continues its tradition today of working primarily with small medium enterprises, family businesses and individuals. We are a full service law firm with a corporate department a dispute resolution department, which it also includes the litigation, adjudication and arbitration, a dedicated employment law and industrial relations department, and a department focused on servicing the needs of individuals and families. Our practice group here indicates some of our focus areas which are actually supported by talents from both our corporate and dispute resolution team. And today's talk is actually part of our MWKA online talk series. By way of background, we have been organizing monthly lunch talks at our office since 2013, some of which was actually broadcasted live and you can view the past videos on our video gallery in our website. But with the COVID-19 pandemic and the movement control order, we have since then moved online in order for us to continue working with our objective of sharing knowledge with you, raising awareness and encouraging networking for our clients, potential clients, and actually also in-house counsel. This is our eighth talk in our MWKA online talks series this year. Now, before I continue, please be reminded that this talk does not constitute legal advice. If you require any specific legal advice to your matter, you can contact us for a complimentary legal consultation. The details will be given at the end of the talk later. Now, allow me to introduce both our speakers today. 
Tommy Wong, as you can see here, is our senior associate in the corporate department. Tommy specializes in mergers and acquisitions, joint ventures and collaborations, project agreements, licensing of IP rights, and regulatory compliance. And next, we have Mira Marshall, who will be our first speaker today. She is our associate also in the corporate department. Mira is primarily involved in the corporate and commercial matters, such as mergers and acquisitions, regulatory compliance, and the drafting of corporate agreements. Mira will be starting things off by giving an overview on what exactly constitutes a constitution and the statutory requirements under the Companies Act 2016. Thereafter, Tommy will then touch on the advantages of a constitution and the differences between a constitution and a shareholders agreement. Now, I know that some of you may have burning questions today regarding our topic, so feel free to type your questions in the Q&A chat box below. We will address these questions at the end of the presentation. And with that being said, I will now pass the floor on to Mira. Over to you, Mira. Thank you, Jasmine, for the kind introduction. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As introduced by Jasmine just now, my name is Mira, and I am a legal associate in the corporate department of the firm. Today, we will be speaking on the company's constitution. I will start at the talk with discussing the first two top points, which are what is a constitution and the statutory requirement under the Companies Act 2016. Later on, my colleague Tommy will continue the talk with discussing the other two top points, which are what are the advantages of a constitution and what is the difference between a constitution and a shareholders agreement. With that being said, let me start. So what is a constitution? A company constitution is defined as a legal document which binds the company, its shareholders and its directors. It is also commonly referred to as a legal contract between the members of the company. So with this being said, it is more legally binding as opposed to a shareholders agreement, as a shareholders agreement only binds the parties that are to the agreement. However, this will be discussed more extensively by Tommy with the difference between a shareholders agreement and a constitution later on in this talk. Now, a constitution generally outlines and set out three important matters. The first one is the objects and the powers of the company. The second is the governance of internal affairs and management of the company. So this will encompass a variety of things. This may include the minimum number of directors required for the company, the AGMs, how is the AGMs to be conducted, conducted sorry, and if there was any conflict of interest, how would this be resolved? Thirdly, there are also procedures set out under the company. So this will cater for different situations. For example, there is also for the disposal and the transfer of shares. Some companies provide specific instructions on exit provisions for their shareholders. And also they provide for certain conditions that have to be fulfilled for existing shareholders before they can transfer their shares to third parties, which includes a tag along clause. Now, a constitution was previously known as a Memorandum and Article of Association, or an m &A. So an m and was provided under the Companies Act 1965. Under an m and there are set out two different, it is separated into two, which is a Memorandum of Association, and secondly, there is an Articles of Association. Firstly, for the Memorandum of Association, this is where the, import, the important information about the company is set out, such as the name of the company, the type of company, and what are the objects and powers of the company. Secondly, we have the Articles of Association. This will provide the internal arrangements and the rules and regulations of the company. However, after the enactment of Companies Act 2016, the m was replaced collectively and is now referred to as a company's constitution. Under a company's constitution, the terms that will be provided under this constitution is generally the rights and obligations of members of a company as provided under the Companies Act 2016. So under the company's constitution, it must provide the rights and obligations that are provided under the Company Act 2016. However, it can modify any of the rights and obligations to suit according to the nature of business. 
However, it should be noted that in the event that there is any modification, but it contravenes with the provisions of the Companies Act 2016, it will be deemed invalid and the provision will have no effect on the members. So some might be asking what will happen for those companies that are incorporated under the Companies Act 1965 and had chosen to adopt an aid. Well, pursuant to Section 619, Subsection 3 of the Companies Act, their m and will continue to have effect at, as if it was made and adopted under the Companies Act 2016. So their m and will continue to remain in force and will be remaining binding upon the members of the company until the company chooses to do either of the following. So first, the company can either choose to abolish the m and and instead to comply with the provisions of the Companies Act 2016, or alternatively, what they can do is that they can amend and adopt a new constitution where it sets out the provision which aligns with the Companies Act 2016. Moving on. Now, some are asking whether it is mandatory for every company to adopt the constitution. Now, it should be noted that under previously under the Companies Act 1965, every company registered and incorporated must have a memorandum of association. So the memorandum of association must be lodged with the registrar of company before the registrar would issue the company with the certificate of incorporation. However, after the enactment of the Companies Act 2016, it is no longer a mandatory requirement for the company to have a constitution subject to it is not a company limited by guarantee, as company limited by guarantee is mandatory to adopt a constitution. So this is provided under Section 31, Subsection 3 of the Companies Act, which requires a company limited by guarantee to adopt a constitution. It's provided under Section 31 of the Companies Act 2016, which states that if a company has no constitution, the companies, each director and each member of the company shall have the rights, powers, duties and obligations as set out as debt. So let's say if the company does not have a constitution, it will follow the provisions of the Companies Act 2016. But it should be noted that under the Companies Act, there's, set, there's a lot of provisions and it contains over more than 500 pages. Whereas if a company's constitution is to be drafted, it will be usually generally will take about 50 pages and will cater to the nature of the business of the company. So as mentioned just now, a company limited by guarantee, it is mandatory for them to have a constitution as provided under Section 38, Subsection 1 of the Companies Act 2016, which states that a company limited by guarantee shall have a constitution. So a CLBG, let me explain generally what a CLBG is first. So it is a company formed on the principle of having the liabilities of its member limited by the assets of the company that it is willing to undertake in the event the company is wound up. So usually the amount of liability will be stated in the CLBG's uh, constitution and it is commonly at a nominal amount. Once the CLBG has adopted a constitution, it must be lodged with the registrar at the time the company is incorporated and it must be signed by the person intending to incorporate the CLBG. It should be noted that also one of the requirements for amending the constitution once it has been lodged is that it must obtain prior approval from the registrar. So under Companies Act 2016, under Section 38, it provides what must be included under a constitution of a CLBG. So it must include this information such as that the company is a company limited by guarantee. It must include the objects of the company. It must also include the capacity, the rights, powers and privileges of the company. It must also include the number of members with which the company proposed to be incorporated. The matters contemplated by the Companies Act 2016 to be included in the Constitution, and lastly, any other matters as the CLBG wishes to be included in its Constitution. So this can be anything suited to why it was established. It also provides provisions that the Constitution is prohibited from including. The first one is that a provision that divides the company's undertaking into shares or interests. So this is because the Companies Act does not allow the incorporation of a company to be limited both by shares and by guarantee. Secondly, it is prohib prohibited for the Constitution to include any provision which gives the person the right to participate in the divisible profits. 
This is in line with Section 45, Subsection 2, which requires a company limited by guarantee to apply its profits or uh, to achieve or promote its objects and thus prohibits the payment of dividends to its members. Okay. Moving on after company limited by guarantee, we have generally the company limited by shares. Now, it is not mandatory for the company limited by shares to have a constitution, but it can choose to adopt one by passing a special a resolution. Now, if it chooses to adopt a constitution, it must lodge the constitution with SSM within 30 days after its adoption. And this is provided under Section 32, subsection 1 of the Companies Act, which states that a company may adopt a constitution for the company and the adoption shall be by way of special resolution. So under this constitution, it can provide the objects and powers of the company. It can also provide what are the special clauses, the special provisions that shall apply to the directors and the shareholders of the company. Another statutory requirement under the Companies Act 2016 is regarding a common seal. Now, a company seal is an official seal used by the company to execute a document. So previously under the Companies Act 1965, it was mandatory for any company that was incorporated to have a common seal for any execution of documents. However, now under the Companies Act 2016, it is no long, longer mandatory to have a company seal. However, if it chooses to have one, it must comply with the requirements set out under Section 66, Subsection 1 of the Companies Act 2016. So under this section, it states that a document is executed by a company, Subsection A, by saying that by the affixing of its common seal subject to the conditions or limitations in the Constitution. So under the new Act, a common seal is optional. So if a company opts to have a common seal, it must comply with the relevant requirements under the new Act, which includes having a constitution in place that lays down the conditions and limitations for the fixation of the common seal. Secondly, there is also a statutory requirement, Companies Act 2016, which states that companies that have a different class of shares shall state in its constitution that the shares are divided in different class and the voting rights attached to the said shares. So all of this is provided under Section 90, Subsection 1 of the Companies Act, which states that uh, for companies that have different shares, it must state in its constitution prominently that the company share is div uh, divided into different classes of shares, which may include original shares or preference shares, and the voting rights and how it is determined that is attached to the shares in each class. So that is the first two talk points that has discussed by me. I will pass along to Tommy to continue with the talk with the other two talk points. Thank you very much, Mira. Hi, my name is Tommy and I am part of the firm's corporate department and I will be speaking on the next two talk points of this online talk series. I do note that there is a comment by one of the attendees that the slides are being moved a bit too quick. So I will do my best to have a few moments to pause before I move on to another slide. Okay, car carrying on. I would just like to recap on the points that were addressed by Mira earlier on. The company constitution is a legal document that binds the company and its members and directors. And the constitution outlines and sets out the objects and powers of the company, the, go the governance of internal affairs and management of the company, and other procedures that the company and the shareholders and directors have to abide by, such as the disposal and transfer of shares, the distribution of dividends as well. As Mira pointed out earlier, although it is not mandatory for a company to adopt a constitution, there are questions as to why companies are constantly being encouraged to adopt one. Now, a constitution contributes to the good governance of the company, such as the procedures, your internal affairs and management. And it is able to be adjusted to the needs of the company at the time of its adoption, i.e. It, pro it provides flexibility, control, transparency and clarity. Now, in the absence of a company constitution, the company's internal governance and management, such as the rights, powers, duties and obligations of the company, shareholders and directors are to be in accordance with the provisions of the Companies Act 2016. Where a company adopts a constitution, such rights, powers, duties and obligations 
will be similar to what is set out in the Companies Act, but to that extent that such rights, powers, duties, and obligations are allowed to be amended, and so amended by the Constitution. First, the modification of such governance. When a company adopts a constitution, it is to be noted that the constitution can still be amended by the members by way of a special resolution, unless the, the constitution in itself expressly prohibits any amendments or modification. So it is important that during the drafting or preparation of the constitution and at the time of adoption, the provisions in the constitution must be in line or in accordance with the provisions of the Companies Act 2016. Moving on to advantages of having a constitution being adopted. Now, it is, strict, it is generally governing the internal affairs and management of the company itself, such as the roles and responsibilities of the shareholders, the shareholders' rights, directors, share capital of the company, and if set out in the constitution itself, maintenance of share capital, the procedure to allot shares and the different classes of shares permitted to be issued by the company, voting rights attached to each class of shares, the disposal and transfer of shares by exiting shareholders, the right of first refusal during the disposal of shares, the distribution of dividends by the company. There are also matters to be resolved by the shareholders and the board of directors. These are known as shareholders reserve matters and board reserve matters. It will also set up a procedure for arranging or calling for meetings of the members. The way directors are appointed as well in the company will be described and set out very clearly what type of directors, how directors are to be removed, the meetings of the board, proceedings of the board, whether how or rather how directors are to declare their conflicts of interest against the company and also inspection of books and records by shareholders as well. These matters are commonly described and set out and governed by the clauses in a company constitution. Other clauses commonly found in the constitution include the objects of the company, share certificates, the minimum number of directors, resignation as well, and also the way and matters that are being passed by resolution. Now, as I mentioned earlier, section 30, or rather, sorry, the constitution is allowed to be amended. Section 36 and section 37 allows for the different methods of amending the company constitution. Section 36 in itself provides that the amendment of the company constitution will be passed by way of a special resolution. And upon the amendment of the constitution, the company and its officers must notify the registrar of companies and thereafter lodge a copy of the amended constitution within 30 days from the date on which the, re the special res resolution was passed in, in view of the amendments. Now, once these obligations have been fulfilled and complied with, the amended constitution will have a binding effect on the company the share, it, and the shares, shareholders and directors. Now, when there's a special resolution, it, it's, it requires a majority vote of 75% by the shareholders who are entitled to vote. However, I do want to highlight again that if the constitution in itself prohibits any alteration, amendment or modification, then the constitution will not be permitted to be amended or modified. Moving on to section 37, another avenue for a company to amend its constitution is by way of an application to court. If the director or member of the company thinks that it should be amended, now the court can make an amendment or amendments by way of a court order on such term that it thinks fit. This is only applicable if it is in the view that it is not practicable to amend the constitution using the procedures of the Companies Act 2016 or the procedures that are set out in the constitution itself. Now, upon the amendment by the court order, it is important that the company and its officers lodge the court order and a copy of the amended constitution within 30 days from the date on which a special resolution was passed. And similarly, 
the amended constitution will have a binding effect on the company and its shareholders and directors. Now, section 36 and section 37 have their, have their own procedures and obligations for the officers to comply with, although the constitution is amended by a separate, a different avenue. With this, with these obligations in place, it is important for the officers to be aware of because under each respective sections of the Companies Act 2016, any failure on the part of the company or its officers to observe Section 36 and Section 37 of the Companies Act 2016, as the case may be, and if convicted, then it will result in the company and its officers being liable to penalties, such as a fine not exceeding 10,000 10, ringgit, and if the offense continues after conviction, then the company and its officers will be liable to a further fine, not exceeding 500 ringgit for each day during which the offense continues. Now, again, a constitution is not mandatory, but it is always encouraged because of the benefits and advantages that is attached to having a constitution in place. I will touch on that shortly as well at, towards the end of my top points. But one of a few of the advantages of a constitution include that the constitution will mitigate any contradictions and inconsistencies, especially if a shareholders agreement or a pre-incorporation -incorpor pre agreement is entered into. Now, for context purposes, a pre-incorporation agreement is whereby the partners or founders of a company enter into an agreement before the incorporation of the company itself. Now, a shareholders agreement is then, or rather typically entered into after the company is incorporated. Um, notwithstanding that, it is to be noted that a pre-incorporation agreement or a shareholders agreement is actually not mandatory by law. Now, another advantage of a constitution being adopted is that it prevents the misuse of the company carrying out activities outside its scope. Now, what are objects of the company? An object, the objects clause in the constitution sets out the purpose and the range of activities that are permitted to be carried out by the company in its ordinary course of business. With such a clause being set out and clearly defined and clearly set out, in the constitution, this clause would then prevent the misuse of the company to carry out any other form of activities that are not permitted to be carried out by the company within the constitution. Now, I believe we have, or rather our firm has previously touched on shareholders agreement in our one of our previous online talks last year, and we drew some comparisons between a company constitution and shareholders agreement. We, are, we will be touching on that in today's talk as well. The common question arising out of businesses and companies are typically within the same line as why should a company consider adopting a constitution when there is already a shareholders agreement in place? Or why should a company even consider adopting a constitution when it is not mandatory? I'll be touching on the differences and the benefits and the prevalence of the constitution and the shareholders agreement shortly. But to touch on it first, the, another question would arise out of the same line as whether or not a company constitution is the same as a shareholders agreement. A shareholders agreement may have provisions that are similar to a company constitution, such as appointment of directors, the structure of the company, meetings of shareholders, meetings of the board, shareholders reserve matters, board reserve matters, disposal and transfer of shares, allotment of shares, financing of the company, and possibly even the distribution of dividends. Now, although that is the case, a company constitution has a wider legal binding effect on the company and the shareholders and the directors. I will touch on this, I think, in the next few slides. On a separate note, a shareholders agreement is typically entered into between the shareholders of the company before or after the company constitution is adopted. Now, what is the main difference between the two documents being the constitution and the shareholders agreement? As mentioned earlier, a company constitution has a wider legal effect. The company constitution binds the company and its shareholders and directors as a whole. A shareholders agreement, on the other hand, binds the shareholders and the company if only the company is made a party to the agreement. Sometimes shareholders agreement 
will only be entered into between the shareholders themselves. And therefore, any obligations or responsibilities or powers or duties as set out in the shareholders agreement will not be binding on the company. So it is important to have a clearly structured shareholders agreement as well. Now, because of the difference in the binding effect between the two documents, it is encouraged that the terms of the shareholders agreement are incorporated into the company constitution to avoid conflicting or missing provisions. There is a case law or there are various case laws to, to suggest or to actually determine and establish that it is the position of the law that the constitution will have a, bind, a, a wider binding legal effect. Now, what if there are conflicting provisions between the constitution and the shareholders agreement? This will then fall onto the position whereby the constitution will generally prevail over the shareholders agreement. Why would, that pre why would the con constitution prevail over a shareholders agreement? The High Court has set out its reasonings under the case of Bei Be, Be Chun Chuan and Palo Medical Center, Sandian Berhad. Now, the High Court held as follows. In order to ensure the terms of the shareholders agreement shall bind the shareholders inter se under the Companies Act 1965, it would be necessary to incorporate the terms into the Articles of Association of the company. In the instant case, being this case, However, the terms in the shareholders agreement did not initiate any proposition to amend the articles to incorporate the terms in the shareholders agreement. The submission that the shareholders agreement governed the conduct of the company and prevailed over its articles of association was untenable. This goes in line with what I've mentioned earlier that the terms of the shareholders agreement and the provisions of the constitution must be consistent. This would then avoid any issues arising out of missing or conflicting provisions and then the issue of which one prevails over, over which. Now, the court essentially explained that a shareholders agreement is a contract between the members of the company to regulate their conduct and define their duties and obligations in the running of the company. However, to ensure that the terms defined in the shareholders agreement shall bind the members being the shareholders and the company under the Companies Act, it will also be then necessary to have the same clauses or provisions set out in the Articles of Association. And just to recap very, very briefly, the Articles of Association and the Memorandum of Associations, as previously described under the Companies Act 1965, they have both merged into what we now know and call as the company constitution under the Companies Act 2016. Highlighting what I've mentioned earlier, shareholders agreements bind the shareholders of the company and it may bind the company itself if the company is a party to the agreement. But then it, the question arises as to whether or not the shareholders agreement will then bind any new and incoming shareholders after the incorporation of the company and the execution of the present shareholders agreement? The answer is no, but what the shareholders and or the company can do is that um, the new incoming shareholders may be bound by the terms of the shareholders agreement by way of a deed of a, adherence, which is usually set out and described as an obligation on the existing shareholders within the present shareholders agreement to fulfill if and when there are new incoming shareholders joining the company or investing in the company, so to say. I have laid out the differences between the company constitution and shareholders agreement in a couple of graphs and charts to set out very distinctively the main points, the main summarized points for you guys to have a look at. Now, I would like to touch on this very quickly. Now, the, as mentioned earlier, a constitution is to be amended if proposed or passed by way of a special resolution. Now, a shareholders agreement, if amended, it is to be agreed in writing between the shareholders or the parties to the shareholders agreement, and it shall be reflected in a supplemental shareholders agreement to record the amendments. Now, the constitution, if amended, it is usually amended with a form, not a form, but a format whereby it, the Lampiran A and Lampiran B, the attachment A and attachment B will set out in table form and in a supplemental document to state. Similarly to the supplemental, any supplemental agreement to set out which clause or which provision is amended and how they are amended. 
So these Lampiran A and Lampiran B will be filed with the Companies, Companies Commission of Malaysia together with the actual amended copy of the Constitution. To summarize our discussion and presentation today, I have set out a few key takeaways. Um, a company constitution binds the company, its shareholders and directors, whereas a shareholders agreement will only bind the shareholders and directors. And if the company is made a party to the shareholders agreement, then it will also bind the company. This then results in the understanding and position pursuant to Beitun Chuan's case that a company constitution will have a wider legal effect and binding effect as compared to a shareholders agreement. This then will allow the company constitution to generally prevail over a shareholders agreement in the event of any inconsistency between the two documents. Thus, although it is not mandatory under the Company Act 2016, it is widely and always encouraged that a company should always consider adopting a constitution to set out the proper governance of its internal affairs and management and procedures so that the company itself and its shareholders and directors will be bound by such provisions in the constitution. With that being said, I would like to conclude my part in this presentation, and I believe Jasmine will then take us to our Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tommy and Mira, for sharing with us today. I hope our attendees learn a little more on the company constitution and the differences between a constitution and the shareholders agreement. We will now take some questions that a few of you have posted in the Q&A chat box. Our first question, Tommy, what is the significance or consideration for the company to be included as a party or not a party to the shareholders agreement? What is the significance or consideration for the company to be included as a party and not a, or not a party to the SHA? It really depends on what is included in the shareholders agreement. If it's just setting out the duties and functions of the shareholders, agree, of the shareholders in the company, then why make, a, why make the company a party to the agreement when there is nothing for the company to observe within the shareholders agreement? For example, if let's say the company is to be responsible for any obligations that are clearly set out or clearly to be set out in line with the fact that the shareholders or the, or the company do not, they do not want to have a constitution adopted, then it is well pertinent to have everything set out in the shareholders agreement, although not all and not every clause in or provision in the constitution will be suitable to be included in the shareholders agreement. Typically, we, I, it is not general that an appointment or removal of directors are set out in what you call that the shareholders agreement because that is clearly between the shareholders. But if a company has any obligations to be observed, I think then it is wise to have a company included as a party to the shareholders agreement. And it is actually quite common for companies to be included as well. Thank you, Tommy, for your detailed explanation. For our next question, Tommy, I believe this has already been addressed in your slide. But anyway, the question reads, in the event of a conflicting clause between the constitution and the shareholders agreement, which, for example, quorum for meetings, which provision would usually prevail? And would also, would there be a prevalent clause in the shareholders agreement override the provision of a constitution? It really depends. You can have a prevailing clause in the shareholders agreement to have in the event of any inconsistency or contradiction between the company constitution, if any, and this agreement, then this agreement shall prevail over the constitution. But again, it is the position of the court that the constitution will have the constitution prevail over the shareholders agreement. That is because if, for example, if the shareholders agreement is not incorporated into the constitution, then the constitution's wider legal and binding effect would take over or rather prevail over the shareholders agreement, notwithstanding the prevalence clause that is particularly and distinctively set up in the shareholders agreement. Thank you, Tommy. Mira, can a company in Malaysia choose not to have a company constitution? Hi, thanks, Jasmine. Thanks, Jasmine. So as explained just now, during the 
talk. A company's constitution is not mandatory under the Companies Act 2016 unless you are a company limited by guarantee. However, explained by Tommy also earlier that the advantages of having a constitution, you can cater it according to the nature of your business and it's easier to refer to. And just in case of any gaps to cater for a situation, there'll be something to refer to. And as I mentioned just now, that in a company's act, you can, if you choose not to have a constitution, you can comply with the provisions of the Companies Act 2016. However, it should be noted that there are a lot of provisions and under the Companies Act, and there are over more than 500 pages. Whereas if you choose to draft a company's constitution, it would be around 50 pages, and you can draft it according to what the company wants on the condition that it will uh, comply with the Companies Act 2016. So it will be better for a company to adopt a constitution. Thank you, Mira. Okay. Now moving on to our next question, Tommy. Under what circumstances would shareholders enter into shareholders agreement after adopting a constitution instead of amending the constitution directly under Section 36 or Section 37 since the constitution has wider binding effects? The shareholders may want to consider setting out clearly how much capital contribution that each shareholder will contribute to the company and in what manner you have paid up capital in cash or non-cash contributions. And in complex shareholders agreements, then it would result in progressive, progressive shareholding structure, such as if let's say during incorporation of the company, Shareholder A provides 100 ringgit, shareholder B provides 5 ringgit. And there's a common understanding between the shareholders that there will be progressive contribution to the company, which would then alter the shareholding percentage or rather the ratio between the shareholders. Then those should be clearly set out in the shareholders agreement as opposed to a constitution. A constitution will not be setting out that, that structure in, or rather the shareholding dilution or structure distinctively within the constitution itself that would be the procedure in that aspect would be set out in the shareholders agreement thank you tommy now mira we actually have a request from one of our attendees could you please give us a recap on what options the companies incorporated under the companies act have Sure. So I think the question is, what is if the company is incorporated, the Companies Act 1965 and chose to adopt MA as opposed to a constitution under the Companies Act 2016? As mentioned just now, so even though if your company is incorporated under the Companies Act 1965 and you chose to adopt MA, it will continue to have effect and binding on the members unless the company chooses to either do two of the following, which is first to either abolish it just abolish it completely and just comply with the provisions of the Companies Act 2016 and what is set out under the Act. Or what it can do is that it can amend and draft a new constitution. So this can include drafting new terms and including new provisions to suit the nature of the business as long as it complies with the provisions of the Companies Act 2016. So there's two options there. Thank you, Mira. If our attendees would like further explanation, you are welcome to fill in the form to request for a complimentary consultation with us. Now, moving on to our next question, Tommy, I will address this to you. Without the constitution, how does a company affix a common seal as the constitution sets out the manner of affixation of the common seal? Under the Companies Act, a company may or may not have a common seal, but if it does adopt a common seal, then if a company adopts a common seal but does not adopt a constitution, then the affixation of the common seal on for or rather use of the common seal in certain circumstances will then be subject to the provisions of the Companies Act. 2016, I think what Mira mentioned earlier in the event of a company seal being subject to the limitations being set out in the constitution, I think that was in line with what I also mentioned earlier. The provisions of the Companies Act can be amended to an extent permitted by the provisions of the Companies Act itself in the constitution. And if the constitution sets out any manner or amended manner of the affixation of the common seal in the constitution, then Yes, please do go ahead. But if not, then it will go back or revert back to the provisions of the Companies Act. And the manner in which you want to affix your common seal will be referred to the different sections of the Companies Act as, as it fits the circumstances. Now, next question to Mira. 
what are the different remedy available for the aggrieved party under a constitution or under shareholders agreement? Hi, thank you, Jasmine. So for the different remedies, it will depend on what is set out under the specific constitution and shareholders agreement. So let's say if judging by the question from what I understand is, let's say if there was a conflict between the constitution and the shareholders agreement, and how do we sort this out to resolve the conflict? So the best option will probably be to amend the shareholders agreement to make it back to back with the constitution. Or alternatively, what you can do is that whatever you have already incorporated in the shareholders agreement to amend the constitution accordingly so that it is aligned with each other. I also think the different remedies is really dependent on what aggravation each or that party suffered under the, under the constitution or the shareholders agreement. So it really depends. That is too general for us to address. Thank you, Tommy. What if the adopted MA contradicts the Companies Act 2016? Would the MA need to be amended? Yes, good question. The, if the provisions of the, let me refer it to as the Constitution, if the provisions of the Constitution contradicts the provisions of the Companies Act, then such provisions will, be, will not be effective or valid. That is the what the companies act has said because the how do I put this the structure the modifications of the procedures and the clauses and the provisions to be adopted by the constitution must be in line and in a way permitted by the provisions of the companies act 2016. So if it does contradict, then it would not be it would not have a legal effect to such an extent that is contradictory. And first, it would be suggested for the company and the officers to quickly amend the constitution to have such inconsistent provisions to be amended. If the company constitution is silent on the method of decision making and the Companies Act 2016 is also silent on it, what would be the solution? If the company constitution is silent, then I think it has to be referred to the court. <laughs> It will be open for interpretation, yeah? <laughs> well, I think it would be between the parties to agree in writing because if there is nothing being said, then so long as the discussions and agreement between the parties to resolve such a matter that is absent in the Companies Act and the Constitution, then such agreement would be put in writing. But it is to be noted that whatever decision or whatever arrangement that is agreed on cannot and should not be illegal or contradicting the legality of such an arrangement and stuff like that. Okay, thank you, Tommy. And our final question, which would be the most popular question in all webinars, is it possible for the attendees to actually have the slides after this session ended? The answer is yes, because it will actually be uploaded onto our website. The link will be posted in the chat box, which you can, it will be posted shortly actually, so you can click on it and look out for the slides. With that being said, we have reached the end of our Q&A session for today. Thank you once again to Tommy and Mira for sharing with us. With that being said, please join us again for our next talk on the 15th of June, 2022. Our senior associate, Hannah Patrick, together with Ryan Chong, will be speaking on liquidated damages for late delivery of vacant possession. And this is under the Housing Development Act. You can click on the QR, you can scan the QR code to sign up for this talk. Follow us on our various social media accounts as well to get the latest updates on our talks and events. And lastly, if you would like to speak to any of our lawyers, we offer a complimentary 30 minute consultation over the phone or video conference. So you can fill in the form, which can be found on our website or scan this QR code on the screen as well. And once again, thank you to everybody for joining us today. We hope to see you during our next online talk on the 15th of June, 2022. Thank you.